Speed. Got me on beat. Brian Stevenson interview, take one, marker. Zach, I'm just going to clear and then it's all yours. Enslaved people, enslaved Africans are brought to this continent uh, first by boat. Uh, 12 million Africans abducted on the African continent, hundreds of thousands brought to the U.S. Uh, they come into Boston and New Haven and Philadelphia and Baltimore and Richmond and New York City and New Jersey and then Charleston and New Orleans. And shipbuilding and the commerce around trafficking of enslaved people, the transatlantic slave trade commerce, is what allowed a lot of these coastal cities uh, to thrive. And you can't really um, evaluate the evolution of New England or the evolution of New York City or Philadelphia or Baltimore without understanding the role that human trafficking, that slave trafficking played. By the time we get uh, to the 18th century, uh, and, and particularly toward the end of the 18th century, uh, these urban communities have evolved in ways where dependence on the transatlantic slave trade is no longer necessary. And because it was always unseemly, I mean, it didn't take a lot of critical thinking to know that kidnapping someone, putting them in chains, trafficking them across the, the, the globe, and then forcing them to engage in labor was wrong. And as the economic need, the economic benefits from slavery began to recede, you see, you hear talk of abolition. You see this emerging uh, consciousness. So by the time we get to the 19th century, uh, the North, New England uh, and, and the East, is prepared to talk more openly about abolition. Uh, the train begins to run in that direction, but but it's in large part because the economic benefits of slavery are not as critical as they have been. The American South, on the other hand, is just developing. States like Alabama didn't become states until 1820. We're just beginning to settle and uh, turn uh, Mississippi and, and Georgia and Louisiana and Alabama and Tennessee and Arkansas to profitable regions of this country, and the, and the demand for slavery there is quite great. And so with declining value to an enslaved population in the North and Northeast, growing value in the South, you see this movement of, of, of slavery from the North to the South, the domestic slave trade. And that movement was accelerated by trains, right? And so while we can think of the train as, a, as a, an engine, a, a force moving toward emancipation, it was first a force uh, that uh, increased and intensified slavery. I, I live in Montgomery, Alabama. Montgomery had uh, the first rail station that connected the Deep South with the North. And so thousands of enslaved people were brought here by rail. Uh, the trains made uh, trafficking of enslaved people a lot cheaper, which meant that it happened a lot more frequently. And uh, you know, by the uh, 1830s, you saw huge numbers of enslaved people coming to the American South every day. Alabama's slave population went from about uh, 20,000 in 1819 to 400,000 in 1860, and that was largely accomplished by uh, the trains. And so while uh, the trains were moving away from slavery in the North and East, they were actually moving toward intensified uh, slavery in the American South. And it was so central uh, to the Southern economy that people were not going to give that up. Lincoln steps into the scene in the midst of that. And while he could go from Illinois to D.C. And, and see the splendor of America uh, from a train, uh, these trains were moving in different directions. The Civil War was in many ways an effort to reckon with the multiple directions, to kind of reconcile them and to try to get the country back on the same pathway uh, toward a country, toward a nation that did not depend on, on human bondage and enslavement. And that was largely achieved, um, but it was just the first leg of the journey. And I think that's what um, many of us are trying to get people in this country to understand. Uh, ending uh, involuntary servitude, ending human bondage, ending uh, forced labor was just the first step. Now getting to uh, these ideologies of, of white supremacy, ending
uh, these narratives of racial difference, ending racial hierarchy, that was going to take another century. And even then, uh, we didn't fully achieve that in the 1950s and 60s. We made some adjustments in the law, uh, but we didn't fully achieve that. There are people today, and you see it, who still believe in these ideas of racial hierarchy, these ideas of white supremacy. So we're still fighting that. I think what happened in the 1950s and 60s was really the second leg of that journey. It was momentous, it was significant. Uh, but we're now in the beginning stages of a critically important third leg. And it will take a lot to get people to appreciate uh, that we are still on a journey and that we cannot celebrate um, freedom, we cannot celebrate equality until we reach the destination. And when you have these disparities that we see throughout America, when one in three black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison, when there are disparities in health and education and opportunity and employment, uh, when um, you, know, you don't see uh, proportionate representation, when people cling to the symbols that those who resist it, even going uh, through the first leg, and use those symbols as political tools to invoke a better time uh, when people want to go back uh, to that first place, then we're going to have, we have to recognize we're in, we're in, a, we're in a real struggle. I think that um, we haven't fully grappled with the institution of slavery. And because we don't have a good understanding of what slavery was and what slavery wasn't, <clears throat> it's hard to evaluate the role of Lincoln, um, who is credited for ending slavery, um, but we don't really understand what that means. I think to understand Lincoln, you have to understand how slavery formed in this country in ways that were very distinct from the evolution of slavery in other spaces. So you have 12 million black people abducted uh, from the African continent, trafficked, uh, kidnapped, abused, mistreated, distributed throughout the Americas. Most of the enslaved Africans were actually taken to Central and South America, but hundreds of thousands came to this country. You know, in Central and South America, you had more enslaved Africans than you had uh, colonizers who were trying to exploit them for labor. And so the way slavery evolved in those societies was, was very different. They became people who were enslaved. Uh, they were part of communities where you had enslaved people. And that history dates back centuries. Something unique happened in America. Um, you had basically a majority European community that was enslaving black people in a different way. And uh, their attitudes were shaped by race, by color. And we made slavery a permanent hereditary status. And so by the time Lincoln comes around, uh, we have a very different relationship to the institution of slavery. There were always countries uh, that, there were always societies that had slaves, but America had become a slave society. We had actually created a whole narrative about enslaved people. <clears throat> and I often argue that the great evil of American slavery wasn't the involuntary servitude, it wasn't the forced labor, it wasn't the bondage. Those things were horrible, but the real evil of American slavery was the idea that was created to justify enslavement in this country. You had religious people and moral people who didn't want to think of themselves as bad Christians, so they had to create a narrative that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people aren't fully human. Black people aren't evolved. Black people can't do this. Black people are less deserving, less worthy. And in my mind, that was the true evil of American slavery. Emancipation, which was achieved during the presidency of Abraham Lincoln, really focused on the involuntary servitude. It focused on the forced labor. Uh, it did not focus on this narrative of white supremacy that was created to justify enslavement. And because of that, um, we didn't really deal with the fundamental problem of slavery in America. And this wasn't just Lincoln, it was also a lot of abolitionists. You had a lot of abolitionists that saw the immorality of slavery, but did not recognize or believe in racial equality. They also believed that black people 
were less capable than white people, less human, less evolved. And they didn't want to see slavery, but they didn't actually believe in true emancipation, true equality. And, and because of that, I think, you know, we, we have the Civil War and the North wins the Civil War, but the, but the South wins the narrative war. That narrative of racial hierarchy persists. And in that respect, I think people can't just say Lincoln was the great emancipator and uh, assign to that moment uh, the freedom of black people and happily ever after, because that's not what happened. And in fact, I've argued that slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. It turns into another era where terrorism and violence and lynching, as you well know, uh, dominates and shapes the, the lives of black people. And we're still contending with this ideology, this narrative of racial difference and this ideology of white supremacy. So I think it's a mistake to not understand these underlying problems with the American experience, with American democracy when talking about Lincoln. I think Lincoln should get a lot of credit for being aligned with the people who saw the institution of slavery as immoral, as wrong. And I'm even prepared to say that he was distinct from even some of the abolitionists who saw the immorality of slavery but believed very strongly in the inequality of um, black people. I don't know that I would even put Lincoln in that category. I just think that he was not prepared or even concerned about uh, equality, about justice, about a full experience. I don't think he saw enslaved black people or black people as Americans, and that shaped his worldview. And, it, and it, it is the source of a lot of the criticisms, legitimate criticisms, that I think you can make about Lincoln and where he stood on these issues. I mean, I just think that the multiple ways that we demonized blackness in this country, we, um, we, we differentiated between people who are black and white in ways that were designed to maintain racial hierarchy have never really been explored. I mean, we had a narrative of racial difference from day one, and it's part of the reason why we haven't acknowledged uh, the genocide of indigenous people. I mean, when Europeans came to this continent, we killed millions of indigenous people. And you couldn't reconcile the famine and the disease and the war and the death and the destruction and the despair of millions of tribal communities that were disrupted uh, by this invasion by uh, Europeans with this concept of freedom and, and justice for all. So you had to create a narrative. And the narrative that was created is that indigenous people, native people, they're different. They're racially different. Those Indians are savages. And because they're racially different, the values that we hold dear, equality and justice for all, they don't apply to that population. That then laid the groundwork uh, for the enslavement of African people. And when black people came, that same narrative was crafted in an even more intense and virulent way uh, because black people were being enslaved. And so we said that black people can't do this and black people can't do this, black people aren't fully human. It was just interesting to me to note that in the state of Maryland, uh, first enslaved Africans don't get to Maryland until about 1642. Uh, <clears throat> and within 20 years, uh, the state of Maryland has actually passed miscegenation laws that make it clear that White people cannot marry, cannot be in relationship with black people. They were already creating a codified legal status to blackness that made black people uh, less worthy, less valuable, uh, something that uh, could not be even loved in the way that we think about marriage and relationship. And that narrative played out throughout this country. And so by the time Lincoln comes into power, we have a very clear idea about the inferiority of black people. We have this very clear idea that black people are not as good, they're not as worthy, they're not, as, they're not equal to white people. And it's hard to navigate that unless you understand the wrongness of that and confront it. And being an abolitionist didn't require you to do that. So a lot of abolitionists bought into that same idea and I think that's what we have never really contended with in this country. Uh, we haven't contended with the problem uh, 
of racial hierarchy, of white supremacy, at this, these narratives. And, and that's because we didn't contend with that. Reconstruction fails, right? After the Civil War, uh, these commitments to voting rights to black, for black people and equal protection all are abandoned uh, because this, uh, this belief in racial hierarchy is greater than our belief in democracy, greater than our belief in equal justice under the law. And so the court stepped back and let thousands of black people get beaten and tortured and traumatized and lynched on courthouse lawns. Uh, the court stepped back and allowed black people to be disenfranchised. They allow black people to be exploited and abused. And that carries on uh, throughout the 20th century. So by the time the 1960s come, 1950s come, where courageous black folks are once again pushing this country to own up to its commitment to democracy, it's a struggle uh, because for a lot of people, they believe that America is a place that values white people over black people. That's their belief system. Uh, it's the reason why we have segregation. It's the reason why we disenfranchise. And when that's challenged, people get really upset. And we pass the voting rights laws and the civil rights laws, but there's never, there was never a reckoning with this basic idea, which was what caused the division uh, during Lincoln's era, uh, that this presumption of dangerousness and guilt that got assigned to black and brown people when they came to this continent, it's still here. And because of that, we're still fighting uh, to overcome that presumption. Uh, we're still trying to get people to reckon with this legacy uh, of, uh, of white supremacy, this ideology of white supremacy, these narratives of racial difference. And uh, until we do that, you know, black and brown people are going to be menaced by police officers. They're going to be disproportionately victimized in various systems and, and health systems and educational systems. And it's why I think um, understanding this period in American history, when we thought we were dealing with the, the issue, needs to be reevaluated. I don't think there's any question that, um, you know, power and the, and, and, and the absence of any transfer of power is at the heart of the struggle that we continue to wrestle with in this country. Um, I mean, you saw progress in Central and South America after emancipation that you did not see in this country because those countries uh, many of them were majority black countries where power could shift. And even though they were still colonies for a very long time, ultimately there would be a moment where power shifted. And what we don't really think about when we think about emancipation for black people globally is this question of power. And we need to think about that. You know, in South Africa, after apartheid ends, power shifts. A black majority takes over. Uh, you know, the Germans lost the war, and as a result of that, um, there is a power shift, and we see so much reckoning with the Holocaust, and we see so much acknowledgement of the Holocaust in that country, largely because there was a shift in power. That didn't happen in America. So there was no reckoning with the institution of slavery. In fact, there was the opposite. Uh, the perpetrators of slavery, the architects and defenders of slavery, were romanticized, were celebrated, were uh, uh, esteemed, and I live in a region today where the landscape is littered with the iconography of Confederate generals and leaders. Uh, uh, you know, my state of Alabama, uh, Con Jefferson Davis's birthday is a state holiday. That was part of an effort to legitimate the nobility of this group of people who were the perpetrators of, of enslavement, who resisted any effort at freedom for black people. And so, yes, you can't understand this history without understanding power. And I think part of, of the challenge with um, overstating uh, Lincoln's greatness is to not be honest about his management of the power he had. So Lincoln didn't want black people to fight for the Union. He just thought it would be too complicated. He knew it would be provocative to Southern enslavers and to the Confederacy. And he also doubted that uh, union, white Union soldiers wanted to empower uh, black people in that way. So he said, no, not going to do it. And it's only when the war necessitated that, that he got to that. If he was really concerned about lifting up uh, to affirming black humanity and equality, that would have not been a debatable issue. It was in part because I think he was trying to manage that. Um, he famously, of course, um, 
wanted to uh, send enslaved and free black people back to Africa. And that part is, you know, I think it's hard for some people to understand that. Well, wh well why would Lincoln do it? He's going to send black people. That's because, again, his commitment was uh, to preserve the democracy, and he just didn't have a vision of uh, black people as Americans, as full Americans, uh, despite the fact that by the time he's the president of the United States, uh, most of the enslaved black population in this country were born in, in, in the United States. The transatlantic slave trade ends in 1808. Uh, the enslaved people that he encountered, the black people he encountered, were born in this country. They had no knowledge of the African continent. And so uh, I think reckoning with that is important, and that's at the heart of so much of what needs to be untangled about the legacy of Lincoln. I think that we've been in a crisis in this country, a political crisis. We've, we've witnessed unprecedented levels of um, resistance to democracy in ways that are just un unfamiliar to a lot of Americans. Uh, things are really polarized, things are really divided. And it harkens to the mid-19th century when uh, political division threatened the future of this country. And I think the threat to democracy that existed in America when you had states succeeding, when you had uh, states uh, leaving the Union, uh, I think is relevant in this moment when the country seems so divided. And the kind of leadership it takes to overcome that becomes a focus. I think a lot of us are trying to understand what's the kind of leadership we need in America uh, to bridge some of these divides, to heal some of these wounds. And so Lincoln becomes uh, relevant because uh, no other American president, probably no other American leader, has spent their career focused on uh, preserving democracy in this country as much as Abraham Lincoln. And uh, to the extent that he is credited with preserving the Union, um, there's a lot to learn and a lot to evaluate to the extent that the problems that created that eruption, that disconnect, that division are still with us, it's, it's also important to reflect on the ways in which um, his presidency and that era failed to address these underlying issues, which I think are pushing so many of the issues of division that we're seeing today. I do think it's important that we recognize the limits of Lincoln's leadership, the limits of Lincoln's achievements when it comes to the question of slavery. I think it begins with first recognizing that the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery. It ended slavery in the rebelling states where there was a military need uh, to get black people to disrupt Confederate behavior. It did not end slavery in America. And in fact, President Lincoln allowed the border states to continue to enslave people. And that concession says a lot about his willingness to sacrifice emancipation in service of preserving the Union. Like I said, I grew up in the state of, of Delaware. Delaware was angry at the end of the Civil War when they were told that they were going to have to end enslavement. And for that reason, didn't ratify the 13th Amendment uh, until uh, the 20th century, almost until 1900. And you saw some of that in Kentucky. You saw some of that in other border states. And so it's a mistake uh, to uh, equate Lincoln's leadership with a prim primary commitment to ending slavery. It's just not true. Now, I think Lincoln believed that slavery was morally wrong, and that's why he could be so eloquent if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong, right? Very eloquent. But he didn't fundamentally believe that the wrongfulness of that institution meant that black people were equal, that black people should be free. He was comfortable paying black soldiers half of what white soldiers got because that's just the world he grew up. He was comfortable saying to black people that you're being selfish. If you stay in this country, you should leave. He never believed that this country was for black people.
And if you don't believe that someone, if you believe that someone doesn't belong here, if you believe that their humanity, their quest for prosperity and, and, and family and, and belonging is somehow uh, not sufficient, is inferior to other people, then you can't actually be you know, esteemed as an emancipator. You don't actually believe in freedom in the way that uh, most of us want it. I don't, you know, like I said, my, my great-grandparents were enslaved. My great-grandfather was enslaved in Caroline County, uh, Virginia. He learned to read while enslaved. Uh, he didn't learn to read because he thought it would help him survive slavery. If anything, learning to read made him vulnerable. It might have meant that he got sold or got separated or even killed. He learned to read because he believed that one day he would be free and he wanted to enjoy and to experience what freedom really means. And that meant being able to understand the things around him. That was contrary to the aspirations of Abraham Lincoln. I think he marveled at somebody like Frederick Douglass who was so eloquent, but he didn't actually believe in creating opportunities that would allow a whole generation of people like that. And so I think there is a harm in failing to reckon with the shortcomings of Lincoln's leadership on these issues. If we don't know, if we don't talk about the fact that he wanted to basically expel, to deport all of the black people in this country after, this, uh, after the Civil War was over, we don't kind of talk about the fact that he didn't really believe in racial equality in that respect. If he really believed that this country belonged to white people and not black people, then we're not going to um, uh, navigate the conversation about what Lincoln represents and who Lincoln is in an honest way. I, I mean, I do think that he was a model of leadership worthy of study and of praise in that he was willing to learn, willing to see, willing to hear. I mean, that story about him, um, his first meeting with Frederick Douglass is an important insight to how much he valued uh, someone who was saying things that were critical, but that were true. And when Douglass says we need to work on this unfair treatment of black soldiers, I think Lincoln took that seriously. He, he didn't have a response to that. Uh, you know, after the 1864 election, uh, you know, uh, Douglas went to the inauguration. Uh, Lincoln saw him in the crowd. Uh, Douglas went to the White House to see him. The people outside the White House said, no, you can't come in. They were going to keep him out because he's black. And uh, he eventually gets there. And, you know, Lincoln says, oh, my God, you're here. And, you know, I don't, I value your perspective more than anyone's. So his attitude shifts over this four-year time period. And I think he would have evolved more uh, but for the assassination. Whether he would have evolved to the point where he could truly be called an emancipator, I don't know. Because we didn't see evidence of that. You know, we didn't see evidence of a commitment to now enforcing the rights of, of emancipated black people. We didn't see that during the Civil War. Um, but I do think he, he was, I do think Lincoln had humility and uh, humility is a greatly underrated quality for leaders, leadership. I, I think humility allows you to hear things, to see things, uh, to consider things that you won't consider or hear or see if you're just so confident that you're right about things. And if, if there is a takeaway from Lincoln's legacy and, and leadership that I think we should embrace and extol and lift up, it would be his humility, his willingness to learn, his willingness to reckon with his bad choices, his, his mistakes, uh, the ways in which he has erred. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that virtue is a virtue, you know, worthy of, of reflection. I, I think there were people in this country that recognize the horrors of slavery and of, of human bondage and exploitation of human beings um, without a war. That is, it, you know, when you step back and think about it, kidnapping was a crime. It was a crime during the 19th century. And here we had hundreds of thousands of kidnapped victims who were not just kidnapped, but then forced into 
labor and bondage and then raped and abused and all of these other horrible things. So it's impossible to not see the wrongfulness of that, to not recognize the wrongfulness of this, even before we get to the war. And so I, I think it's appropriate to be critical of Lincoln for not being fully mindful of the primacy of, that, of ending that institution and of basic human equality even before we get into the, to, to the war. I think the war intensified the complexity of the debate and when he saw um, uh, black people who were contributing and, and fighting and uh, pushing uh, for their own emancipation, that, that changed things. But I, I, I don't, I, I guess I don't know that um, you need the crucible of war to see basic human truths about human dignity, about human value. I just think too many people were able to get there without that to make that a necessary condition uh, for the evolution that we then see in Lincoln. It's, the, it's what happens with Lincoln, but I, I, I don't believe that um, it's a requirement. Just like today, I don't believe that you should have to see black people you know, killed by police officers unarmed on the street uh, to persuade others that there are these problems of racial bias and bigotry. Um, we shouldn't have to keep proving these points. Uh, we should just be committed to that notion of equality and that some people can get there and other people can't, for me, just reinforces the fact that we all ought to be able to get there if we're motivated to do that. I mean, I look at things like gender. I mean, there were, there were women in the 19th century that were making the argument that, look, we should be able to vote. We should be able to do all of these things. Our, our sex does not make us inferior. And we've made progress on those issues. So, I mean, I appreciate the forward step toward progress. I'm, I'm not so uh, indifferent to incremental progress that I, I'm going to just complain about that. But I guess I have a harder time conceding that the war was a necessary condition for a leader's evolution. It may have been necessary for Lincoln, but th that would be a disappointment rather than a virtue for me. Well, I think uh, Douglas and Lincoln had a very complex relationship. Uh, Douglas endorsed uh, Lincoln in the 1860 election because he saw him as someone who did reject slavery, who expressed moral opposition uh, to slavery, but he knew that um, the plight of black people was not Lincoln's priority. And I think he was energized by the election and when the Civil War arrived, uh, wanted Lincoln to affirm the importance of freedom and emancipation for black people, and he didn't really do that. And so Douglas criticized Lincoln. And I love the story about how, um, you know, back in those days, oddly enough, you could actually go to the White House and just say, I want to see the president. And if you waited long enough, you would get that. And so that's what Douglas does. And eventually, uh, he's called in, and he actually they, they allow him to skip the line into his amazement. Lincoln knew who he was, had read one of his speeches, had read this, one of the speeches where he criticized uh, Lincoln. And I think it impressed Douglas that he was treated as an equal, that uh, Lincoln respected him. And, and that was something that affirmed him. He was there because uh, after allowing black soldiers uh, in the fight, uh, they weren't being treated fairly. And, and Douglas was there to criticize uh, you know, Lincoln and the administration for not giving equal pay to black soldiers and providing equal benefits to black soldiers. And I think that kind of, I appreciate that I have the opportunity to be in the room and to express these uh, thoughts to you. I appreciate that you're dealing with me as an equal, but your policies are failing uh, the, the aspirations of black folks it was very much the dynamic that emerges between uh, Lincoln and Douglas. I mean, Douglas was committed to full equality for black people. Lincoln wasn't. And as a result of that, there were times when that interest convergence, which would sometimes make them very good partners, would mean that they're on very dis distant places. And I think what, what Douglas was trying to do in that speech was to get Lincoln and his supporters to 
to identify with the plight of black people who have had to fight so hard just for basic security, basic freedom. And uh, it was, it was, and I think it was his hope that if he could get people to think about that, they would, they would embrace this quest for freedom and equality. Uh, you know, Douglas called Lincoln a white man's president, and in many ways he was. Uh, and, and that was part of the reason why, you know, when Lincoln was inviting black leaders to the White House to persuade them to urge black people to leave, to go back to Africa, he knew not to invite. Frederick Douglass, because Douglass was committed to full emancipation in this country. He said, I was born in this country. I've toiled in this country. I've been fighting for equality and justice for this country, and you shouldn't be able to just kind of dismiss me and send me away because of my color. So there was complexity there, a lot of complexity there. You know, I think Lincoln respected Douglass, but he didn't fully embrace the aspirations of not only Douglass, but of many emancipated black people who wanted to be fully free. Well, I think he recognized that there was a moral necessity uh, to reckon with the, with the ravages of slavery. I, I mean, I, think, I don't think it's debated much that Lincoln's priority was preserving the Union. His priority was not ending slavery. And, and you'll recall that he did not actually um, say we're going to fight this war to end slavery, you know, the South succeeded. They initiated this conflict, and he wanted to make sure that the Union endured. I think it didn't mean that he didn't believe that slavery was wrong. I think he did. Uh, and I think when it came time to emancipating enslaved people in the rebelling states, and that's the thing you have to remember about the Emancipation Proclamation, it only granted emancipation, it only granted freedom to enslaved people in the rebelling states of the Confederacy, the enslaved people in Delaware, the enslaved people in Maryland, the enslaved people in Kentucky, and in other parts of the country were not made free by the Emancipation Proclamation. If you're going to free uh, enslaved people, you want to invoke all of the language, all of the forces that legitimate that proclamation, and that's what Lincoln does. The difficulty with it is that if you genuinely believed all of that, you would emancipate all enslaved people, which is not what the proclamation does. It's an important step, obviously. It's an incredibly uh, important moment in American history. But if we don't understand that it's not total emancipation, if it's not a complete repudiation of slavery in all of its form, in all locations, we misinterpret uh, some of those words. We misinterpret some of that language. He knew that to keep these other border states out of the conflict, he had to concede. And he conceded by allowing them to continue uh, to enslave people. And that, you know, that showed up. You know, when I was in school, I actually grew up in southern Delaware, which was a border state. And uh, I remember being in, you know, sixth grade, and the teacher said to me, uh, the integration had just come to our school, uh, do you know what the Emancipation Proclamation is? And I didn't say anything. He says, well, you need to know because that's what gave you your freedom. And I just sat there and I felt a little, you know, humiliated that I was being talked to in this way. And then when I later learned uh, that the Emancipation Proclamation actually didn't give enslaved people in that part of the state their freedom, I felt the need to write a letter to that civics teacher, that history teacher, to make sure that, that, that there was an understanding. But that failed understanding, I think, is what gives some of the um, complexity around Lincoln, um, uh, you know, it's what makes it so important that we understand uh, that that complexity is there. I mean, many people like Frederick Douglass wanted Lincoln at the very outset to allow black people to fight during the Civil War. And he wanted it because he very much wanted the narrative to be that we fought for our freedom. He wanted to push back against this idea that there was something acceptable about bondage to enslave black people, which a lot of white enslavers would perpetrate. They would try to make that argument. And, and it was important to Douglas and other black leaders that that be fundamentally rejected. And uh, Harriet Tubman and, and others who were leading people out of slavery to kind of make the point that we could kind of play a role in our own emancipation. 
uh, ultimately wanted uh, to engage in the fighting as a way of proving not only uh, that slavery was wrong in all of its forms, but to claim our stake in this, this new democracy. And, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass had his two sons uh, uh, join the Union Army, and that's how much he felt, you know, he felt very strongly about that even though, you know, the casualties and the fatalities were quite high, he was prepared to encourage his sons to engage in that battle because he believes you have to fight for freedom. And like a lot of others, he wasn't satisfied to just be, quote, not enslaved. And, and it's part of the reason why some of his rhetoric was so intense. You know, his 4th of July speech was powerful speech. He says, this is not my holiday. We aren't free. Uh, the collapse of, of black uh, opportunity during Reconstruction was just what he feared in a society where we weren't actually talking about the right things. And so, yes, I do think that what black people did to, first of all, win the Civil War is an important part of the story. What black people did to create an economy for this country that allowed it to thrive, even after a civil war. What black people did to commit to the American idea of democracy uh, and community after being mistreated for so long, abused for so long. I, I, I'm still struck by uh, how, how little enslaved black people resorted to violence and retribution and retaliation against those who had enslaved them. Uh, and, and I think that has to be acknowledged. We have to really honor this quest for a real America that was understood and shaped and embraced by black people, even before it was embraced by white people, because the white people who had enslaved them used violence to intimidate, threaten, and to persecute them, even after uh, the Civil War, even after the 14th and 13th Amendments and 15th Amendments had guaranteed them rights. Uh, and, and I think that's the part of the American story that we haven't quite developed. And if we don't talk about that, we do do harm. We, we kind of, we take this false idea that, that if it weren't for the benevolence of white people, then, you know, slavery wouldn't have ended and this wouldn't have happened and that wouldn't have happened. It's just a distorted view of history. For many black people who were born in this country, the model of freedom that they knew was what white people had. Um, they saw white people who um, owned things, who ha got married, who had children, who went to church, um, who if they worked hard were rewarded for their hard work. That's what freedom meant. That was the model of freedom that they had before them. So they wanted that. They didn't want to just be uh, not enslaved. They wanted to be free. And that interest in education, that interest in family, that interest in community, that interest in hard work that gets rewarded was very much a part of what emancipated uh, formerly enslaved people uh, had, uh, were committed to. And in fact, I don't think that generation of formerly enslaved people have gotten near the credit that they deserve for believing enough in America that when emancipation finally did come, they didn't want revenge. They didn't find ways to retaliate and to be violent with the people who had been violent with them. They said, you know what, we believe in, in this society enough, we're going to actually step into it, participate in it, get our right to vote, commit to education. And black people uh, were committed to education, and so their quest for freedom was full freedom. It was the freedom that white people had. It was the freedom that other immigrants were getting uh, when they came to this country. And I think for a lot of people, uh, particularly during the Civil War era, freedom just meant you, we're not going to enslave you. We're not going to value you. We're not going to give you protection. We're not going to give you rights, but we won't enslave you, and you ought to be satisfied with that. And you can only justify that if you if you have held on, held on to this view that black people are somehow not as good as white people. And that's why, for me, I don't think we are yet free. I, I mean, I, when I give talks, I say we're still not free because we still haven't been able to achieve opportunity and access to a lot of things without the burden of this long history, without these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt that get assigned to black and brown people. I'm a lawyer, 
I've been working for a really long time. I've argued cases at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, you know, I got a lot of degrees and all of that, but I will still go places where I am presumed dangerous and guilty, and I have to navigate these presumptions. And I can tell you that when you, when you get old enough, you get tired. You don't, you don't want to keep navigating these presumptions. And it bothers me that uh, here we are in the 21st century, and we have a generation of black babies being born where they're still confronting these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt. And that's why uh, this broader quest for freedom, this broader call for freedom, is so urgent, uh, particularly now. I've always loved uh, the Lincoln Memorial um, because, because it does represent a place where the aspiration of American democracy is so well expressed. I mean, I think Lincoln was an extraordinary orator. His, uh, his identity as a lawyer made him care a lot about words. And Lincoln said things that were powerful about what uh, justice should mean. And you read those words and it's, it's quite compelling. Um, you know, I think about uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. So, of course, when that was issued, it did not free all enslaved people. It was done to kind of manage this war uh, where uh, enslaved black people were needed to, 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 to revolt, to kind of resist in an active way. Uh, but the border states who had agreed not to join the war, states like Kentucky and Delaware and Maryland, were very unnerved by it. They thought that by not joining the war, the reward would be uh, that they got to keep slavery. And they did get to keep slavery. And some of them kept pressing Lincoln about this commitment. And I, I saw one of the letters that he wrote. And what he wrote to these enslavers in Kentucky is uh, this, he made this statement, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. It's a really powerful way to articulate the wrongfulness of this institution. And so his way with words uh, was really inspiring. And when I was last at the Lincoln Memorial, I read uh, those parts of his addresses that are engraved in that, and I was very moved by that. And I think he had uh, a really com a compelling ability to articulate aspirations of a democracy, of people, in ways that, you know, you have to admire. I think in many ways um, uh, we, are still, we are still living with the legacy of slavery, that we did not achieve its end in abolition, even with uh, the North's victory during the Civil War. As I've said, you know, I, I think the North won the Civil War, but the South won the narrative war. That idea of racial hierarchy, of exploitation of black people for economic benefit, it survived, and we see evidence of that uh, throughout the 20th century. Convict leasing emerges at the end of the 19th century. It's another kind of enslavement of black people. Sharecropping and tenant farming were systems that were created to benefit white landowners and exploit black labor throughout most of the 20th century. Uh, even as we get into more industrialized forms of, of labor, uh, black people are disadvantaged, black people are disfavored. Even when the American government needs black bodies to go to war during World War I and World War II, uh, they're not treated equally. They don't get the benefits of these victories. Uh, we passed the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and white people leave the schools because they don't want to have actual integration, and white leaders find new ways to uh, suppress and limit uh, the power of the black vote. We're still contending with those issues uh, today. So I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to understand the ways in which uh, our quest for freedom uh, would have been uh, altered uh, if the South had won the war I think in many ways they, they did win a part of that war, and because of that, um, we are still struggling uh, to win that freedom. And I, I just think, if you think that there was this problem with slavery, uh, black people were brought here, it was, you know, everybody did it, nobody was really wrong, it's just what happened, and, 
Then we fought a war and then slavery was over and everything was fine, so let's move on and people should stop talking. If that's your view of American history, uh, then you're never going to appreciate many of the issues that are happening around us. It's a false view, it's an uninformed view, it's an ignorant view. It's a view that a lot of people have been taught. I mean, most people in this country don't get taught anything about the transatlantic slave trade and how it was the source of economic development in New England and New York and in New Jersey. Most people can't even tell you how many enslaved people were actually brought to this continent during that era. Uh, when you start asking about the details of slavery and the, and the nuances, they can't tell you about that either. We just kind of skip over that. They, they know a little bit about the Civil War, uh, but then they see the North Wind, and the assumption is everything is fine after that. They can't tell you about Reconstruction. They don't know about convict leasing. They know nothing about that era of lynching and the violence and the trauma that that created. They don't understand the way the demographic geography of this country is shaped by that mass exodus in the 20th century, which is rooted in lawlessness and violence. Uh, they, they learn something about Rosa Parks and Dr. King, and they think, well, that then cleared up all the other issues without appreciating uh, that there was, no, there was no concession. You know, the governors of these southern states didn't say, oh, you know what, you're right. This thing about segregation, this thing about white supremacy, we were wrong about that. They said segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. They positioned themselves as obstacles to integration and full opportunities for black people. And uh, that consciousness has never actually been acknowledged. When was the moment when we all, all of us, said everything about our history as it relates to the experience of black people, enslavement and lynching and segregation was wrong, and we now must commit to never again allow racial bias and discrimination uh, to undermine our, our democracy? When did that happen? Because I missed it. Uh, you have people saying things, but we've never made that commitment. And because we haven't made that commitment, you see at the beginning of 2021, people storming the Capitol with Confederate flags and gallows and nooses in an effort to, quote, make America great again, as if somehow our best days were in that 19th century when black people were still enslaved, or our best days were during that period of time when black people were being lynched or our best days were during that era when the law prohibited black people from going to school or having equal opportunity. And I just think until we reckon with that history, with that understanding, uh, we're gonna find new manifestations of this problem. I think a lot of people a century ago would have believed that by now, we live in a country where these disparities based on race, where these attitudes of racial bias, where white supremacy had been permanently eliminated. That has not happened, and it won't happen a hundred years from now, if we just keep repeating the same false ideas about our past and about our background. My big critique of our whole conversation about our whole discourse around the Civil War and that period of American history is I think too many people believe that uh, slavery ended in 1865, that the problems of black people were ended on the battlefield, when uh, that's just simply not true. And the essential problem of racial hierarchy and white supremacy, which was at the heart of this conflict, was never addressed. It wasn't addressed by Lincoln, it wasn't addressed by many in Congress, and it certainly wasn't addressed by our courts. And that's what has set up, you know, a, a 150 years of conflict and struggle and challenge that we're still contending with uh, today. Uh, you know, I, I admire Lincoln, I value Lincoln's commitment uh, to, 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 to seeing uh, the war through, to uh, making concessions, uh, to allowing black soldiers to, to fight, to continuing to insist on movement toward uh, abolition. But I, I, I just think it has to be placed in context. We, you know, and, I, and I just think you know, when, we, when we exaggerate and overstate, we, we give I think we compromise on a true understanding of our history and a true understanding of who we are and where we are at this mo moment. I think the era of single leaders guiding us through uh, difficult moments has largely passed. I just think governance in the United States is no longer entirely in the hands of a president. 
uh, you've got a tech sector that has huge sway over how people act and think. Uh, you have um, local leaders that can shape uh, attitudes and thoughts at the local level. You have uh, corporations, you have influencers, you have media. All of these institutions are stronger and more influential. So I think the idea that a single national leader uh, can address these fundamental challenges is simply not, um, not credible, at least to me. I think we all have an obligation to learn our history and to reckon with it. And when we do that, we all become equipped to actually achieve the kind of just society that we want, to achieve uh, movement of this country toward that place uh, where we have equality, where there's freedom. I, I don't think we can wait any longer for another King or another Lincoln or another anybody. I think the burden is now on us. The, you know, we've gotten to this place where all of us have access, most of us have access to information. We just have to commit to it. And that's why for me, um, it's important that we understand who our, our leaders have been, where they succeeded, where they failed. It's important to understand what the institution of slavery was really about. It's important to understand what the Civil War did and didn't. It's important to understand our history from Reconstruction till the 1960s. It's important to understand what the experience of blackness uh, and being a person of color is like in this country today. And with that understanding, I think we can get where we're trying to go. I mean, I, I'm really persuaded by that. I don't think you can achieve equality. I don't think you can achieve a healthy community unless you're willing to engage in truth-telling about it. You know, I come from a faith tradition that is rooted in a central idea. Uh, and uh, they believe that every, my, my people believe that all of us uh, can achieve redemption, uh, you know, salvation, fulfillment. Uh, and they invite people into these spaces where they offer that. But they say you cannot achieve these things unless you are first willing to confess to repent. If you come to my church and you say, I want the heaven and the redemption, I want all that good stuff, but I don't want to talk about anything bad, they'll say it doesn't work like that. You've got to first confess, you've got to first repent. And it's not just to make you feel bad, but it's because it is a process. When you acknowledge the mistake and the error and the harm and the wrong, you then appreciate the remedy, the repair, the restoration, the reconciliation, the redemption means something to you that you hold on to. And societies that have moved forward have moved forward precisely because they've been willing to engage in that truth-telling. I wouldn't go to Germany if it was a place where Adolf Hitler statues were everywhere. If they were still celebrating the architects and defenders of the Holocaust and the Third Reich, I wouldn't go there. I'm sorry, I just wouldn't. And it wouldn't matter what else they were doing. I would not feel safe in that space, but because there is a reckoning with the Holocaust because there are memorials, because you can't go 200 meters without seeing the stones and the other emblems, because there are no Adolf Hitler statues. I'm prepared to go, and I'm prepared to respect what's happening there. And I know it's not a perfect space, but I understand that there's been some progress. And I think that's the reason why you have to commit to truth-telling. You commit to truth-telling because you want the reconciliation, you want the restoration, you want the redemption, and you commit to truth and justice because you know, I believe there's something better waiting for us. I mean, I really do. I don't talk about this stuff because I want to punish America for lynching and slavery and all of these terrible things. I'm not interested in getting people to confront the realities of slavery because I want to punish America for this. I'm interested in talking about these things because I want to get us to liberation. I really believe there's something better waiting for us. There is something that feels more like freedom, feels more like equality, feels more like justice than anybody in this country has seen collectively. But to get there, we have to stop this false history. We have to push back against these false ideas. We have to deal honestly. We have to tell the truth about our history, about who we are and about how we get here. And when we do that, that's when we open ourselves up to the kind of reconciliation, restoration, redemption, repair that I think any broken society needs, any fallen society needs. And we have been broken by this history. You know, there's just no two ways about it. And I think the idea that you can um, overcome 
uh, an injury, overcome a lethal disease without care and treatment is just a misguided idea. And people die every day holding on to that idea. But the people who commit uh, to the care, to the treatment, uh, those are the ones that live and thrive and actually create new hope and, new, and a new future. I think what, we've, what we're seeing today is really dramatic evidence of what happens when you fail to talk honestly about your history when you actually believe that the best time in American history was 150 years ago, was 100 years ago, was 50 years ago. I mean, if some German leader comes along and says, make Germany great again, and they start invoking the Germany of the 1930s, we know enough about what happened to understand what that represents. But in this country, we are actually so uninformed about our history that we actually think our best days we're in some prior past. Well, as a black person, I'm really confused by it because I really want to know, are, are you saying our best days were when black people were enslaved or when we were lynched, when we were excluded and segregated, uh, when we were denied opportunities? Help me understand it. For women, when were the best days? Before they had the right to vote? When they weren't in positions of leadership? When they couldn't have the opportunities that other men have? And it's only because of that false history that you can say some of these things. And I'm less interested in political beliefs and values, but I am interested in a true understanding of who we are. It's like everything else. If you think that smoking doesn't cause cancer, doesn't hurt you, and you just keep, then you're gonna see elevated death rates. You just are. But when you confront the truth of it, you begin to understand some things about that habit that will cause you to shift your behavior. If you think, cancer doesn't kill you and you won't get treatment for it, you're going to die. You're going to see death rates increase. And the same is true for a healthy democracy. If you think that you can leave unaddressed this fundamental question of equality and justice and freedom and racial injustice and racial inequality and be a thriving, healthy democracy, uh, you're going to be sadly mistaken. And, and we're at a moment in our nation's history where uh, I think that reckoning is upon us. This is an opportunity. We, you know, we do a lot of things to kind of make it easy for people to, to not have to talk about this, to not look at this. Well, we see black people achieving over here. We see black people achieving over there. We see black people. So that's, you know, that can, well, we, that's happening, so we don't have to deal with this. It doesn't work like that. You know, this is the fundamental issue. And so, yes, I do think uh, truth-telling about our history uh, is, has never been more urgent. And truth-telling generally, I mean, this is such a time of disinformation and confusion that if we don't commit to truth-telling in a, in a really profound way, uh, we're not going to preserve uh, this democracy. We're not going to have the kind of just, free America that many of us want to see. I do think language is really important. I think the people who have had platforms that get to define things, that get to describe things, um, because they haven't been very representative of the entire population, the language reflects a certain kind of bias. Uh, so I don't use the word slave. I don't think people were slaves. That, that, that suggests an identity, that that's what they were. Uh, no. It, people were enslaved. They were put into bondage. That wasn't their natural condition. That's not who they are. We don't, you know, say to people, um, you know, who have been kidnapped, you know, you're, a, you're an abductee or something. It, it, it's something we do to someone. And I think these words have power because when you realize that there were no such thing as slaves, there were people who were enslaved, it changes your focus. The focus isn't on the person, uh, it's on the people who enslaved them. It's on the enslaver. I don't believe, you know, even terms, I don't get hung up too much on it, but even terms like slave owner, uh, that to me that's, that kind of built, that feeds the lie that people could be owned. That's a false notion. Human beings can't be owned by another person. I prefer the term enslaver because that's what they were. They enslaved other people. And as we, you know, we've been doing work on, on lynching violence, and I like to use the word terrorism to describe that era. Uh, 
because we now have a consciousness about terrorism, and we actually think that people who are terrorists are worse than criminals. We can put terrorists in prisons and never give them a trial. We, can, we recognize the threat posed by that. We have different rules for terrorists. And what happened to black people uh, between Reconstruction and the 1950s and 60s was terrorism. When mobs were allowed to pull people out of their homes and beat them and torture them and burn them and lynch them on the courthouse lawn with impunity, that's terrorism. And you can't appreciate the trauma that black people had to navigate until you understand that they were dealing with terrorism. They weren't dealing with crimes. These weren't crimes. This was terrorism. And so language does matter. Uh, when we talk about uh, civil rights laws and, and segregation, you know, those signs that said white and colored, they weren't directions. They were assaults. That was violent. It's violent to live in a world where you're told you can't go through this door but that door. It forces you to behave in a way that is not natural or normal or healthy. And when you have to behave in ways that are not healthy or natural and normal, you create injuries. And these injuries weren't kind of self-inflicted. They were created by people who developed a system that insisted on racial hierarchy, that insisted on racial segregation. And the people who perpetrated and defended that system did something destructive and violent uh, to a race of people. And you have to understand that. And so the language matters a lot. And I, I hope that as new people get to occupy the spaces of historians and writers and filmmakers and uh, storytellers, that the language can begin to reflect a more honest accounting of this history.